Would you open your Bibles, please, to the epistle of the Ephesians. Ephesians. We're going to be looking at this wonderful lesson that Paul is teaching us. And I've titled the lesson, For This Reason. Ephesians chapter 3. We are returning to the epistle of Ephesians. It's a wonderful description of the Christian life from beginning to end. And as such, it is a fitting complement to the exposition of the Sermon on the Mount, which we just recently finished. Now, this letter to the Ephesians can be broken up into two sections, which in technical terminology can be called the indicatives and the imperatives. The word indicative basically means a statement of facts or truths or things that exist. There are, these are covered in chapters 1 to 3. The imperatives are the commands which are given to us in chapters 4 through 6. Simply put, the indicatives in chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians refer to the facts of what Christ has done on our behalf in accomplishing our salvation, while the imperatives found in chapters 4 to 6 are the commands that he has given us to obey now that we are his disciples and which will be a demonstration of our love for and our loyalty to him. What did Jesus say to us through in his gospel? He said, if you love me, you will obey me. He who loves me will obey my commands. Now, why do we obey the commands of Christ? Out of some sort of a burden? If we obey these commands, he's going to like us? He's going to approve of us? No, not at all. We obey those commands because they glorify him. And we want to glorify him as we are obedient to his word. This is what's going on here when we deal with commands. Paul carefully and comprehensively has listed the details of all that the Father has done for us in Christ Jesus, beginning in chapter 1 until he gets to chapter 3, where he begins by saying, for this reason, or because of what God has done. And then in verse 14 of Ephesians 3, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, when Paul says, for this reason, he is pointing to the purpose of his ministry and the things that God has done on our behalf. And this opening statement draws us back to the first two chapters of the letter to the Ephesians, where Paul speaks of the fact that before God created us, before he created anything, literally, he knew his children by name having chosen them beforehand, before he created anything, that they would be adopted into his family. How secure is your salvation if you belong to him? If he has chosen you, he will keep you. He also predestined his children. That word means literally, he previously determined our destiny. I spoke about this in Sunday school. A lot of people don't like the word predestination. They don't like the word election and all these other things because it puts too much on God and takes away what we think is our, our place or our thing. We think that we have some kind of power. But in Ephesians 2, when we get to Ephesians 2, you'll see that before Christ had mercy upon us, we were dead. How much, how many things do dead people do? We've been to funerals before. We've seen our loved ones in the casket. They don't get up. They don't say anything to us. We wish they would. But they don't do anything because they're dead. And before Christ had mercy upon us, we were dead. But in eternity past, he chose some to be his own. That's why he said in Ephesians 
1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And he gives us a purpose so that we will be holy and blameless before him. And how, are we, how can we, being wicked sinners, be holy and blameless before a holy God? It is because of the imputed holiness of Christ and the righteousness of Christ that we can be holy and blameless before him because he has wiped our slate clean. This is, this is what God has done. When he predestined us, he purposed in eternity past to send his one and only son to this earth in order to live a life of perfect conformity to his own law, to die a sacrificial death in the place of those he intended to bestow eternal life upon, and then to rise from the dead, demonstrating that he had accomplished his, his eternal purpose. This one-time sacrifice accomplished the redemption of the souls of those whom God has, had chosen to receive eternal salvation. And to all who receive this salvation, God has given the Holy Spirit to dwell within them. The earnest of our inheritance, which is what the scriptures say, that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, meaning he is the promise that what God has begun to do, he will complete. For he who began a good work will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ or the day of Christ's return. Paul then spoke of the fact that we have been dead in trespasses and sins. This is chapter 2, and I've already explained a little bit of that, but the word dead in the Greek language is nekros, and it literally means a corpse. And again, corpses do nothing. The scriptures tell us that we were dead in trespasses and sins. That is, we were slaves to sin. This is what we loved. This is where we lived. This is all we knew. We were slaves to the devil to do his will. But then God, in that divine rescue mission, delivered us from the domain of darkness, from spiritual death. He removed removed us from the grasp of the evil one and set us free from the tyranny of the devil. We just read that in our confession, did we not? And then Paul makes this great declaration that God raised us up with Christ. When Christ was raised from the dead, we were seated in heavenly places with him. It says, our salvation is as good as is done. He has accomplished his purpose. And he's done so, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Then to destroy any source of pride, any possibility where somewhere we might want to boast, any place somewhere where, it's, where we might say, well, I had a hand in my salvation, Paul said that we had been saved by the grace of God, which is a gift. We have been saved through faith, which is a gift. And then he says, we are his workmanship. He has accomplished everything. What we could not do, weak as we were in the flesh, as Romans chapter 8 says, we could not save ourselves. But God sent his only son, his one and only son, into this world to accomplish our salvation. So you see, for those of us who, are, who find ourselves in Christ today, it is by his doing that we are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, meaning that God revealed himself to us and righteousness as he clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. And sanctification, having set us apart for himself. And redemption, because it was he himself who purchased us with his blood. Just as it is written in the scriptures say, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The Lord alone. It was for this reason that Paul wrote this letter 
to the church at Ephesus. Because of this great salvation that God had accomplished for sinners through the life, death, and resurrection of his son Jesus Christ, you who were far off have been brought near and have been granted eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's go further. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says, For this reason, for this purpose is the reason I wrote this, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, where Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus from a Roman prison. He was Christ's prisoner, which I believe makes what he is saying all the more amazing to be able to make these glorious declarations while in such a condition as this is staggering. Prisons in Paul's day were nothing like what we have today. What we have today is more of a country club compared to a prison in Paul's day. You wanted to have some, some food to eat, someone had to bring it to you. You wanted to close the wear, somebody had to bring them to you. You want water, you didn't want to, you had to be sustained by others because you, there was nothing, there was no programs to, say, to take care of you. Now most people, even in prison today, are not thinking about anyone or anything else but themselves and the misery that they are experiencing now. And you would think that Paul would be of the same persuasion seeing that he had not been hurting anyone. He had, he had been telling sinners the good news that Jesus Christ had come to save people from their sins. And for this, he was in prison. But Paul was of another mind. Literally, he was of another world, just as all those who belonged to Christ. He viewed things from a heavenly perspective. Instead of musing in the midst of his dumps as John Bunyan would say in the book Pilgrim's Progress, instead of sitting there and, and whining and being miserable, he was looking away from himself to the glory of God and the good of the members of this church in Ephesus whom he loved and to whom he had ministered for three years. He knew these people by name. This flock was more dear to Paul than his own life. And having heard that they were continuing in the faith and in love for one another, he longed to instruct them further in the truth of the word of God in order for them to grow stronger still, both in the word and in the faith they professed. And so he used the only medium that he had, writing. He took up his pencil and his paper, or pen and paper, and he wrote this magnificent letter that we have in our hands today. Now consider the next phrase that Paul says. This is again Ephesians 3.1. Paul says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. This is a stupendous declaration because it means that the reason we are in Christ today those of us who are, have called upon his name for salvation. The reason we have been included in the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ is because in mercy, he, Christ, did not come merely to save the Jews. But his eternal plan included the Gentiles as well. This is the mystery Paul spoke of in chapter 1 when he said in all, all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to the, an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. And what was the sum of this mystery? In chapter 3, 6, Paul spells it out. He says, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We have been included. In, in Romans chapter 9, 
In fact, I'll let you turn there if you like. Romans chapter 9, we'll pick up at verse 21. Romans chapter 9, and verse, beginning at verse 21, this is Paul's letter to the church at Rome, and here he spells out this truth when he speaks of the fact that God has created everything for his own purpose in order to bring glory to himself. And he says in Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 21, he says, Or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and he did so in order to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he has called not from among Jews only but also from among the Gentiles as he says also in Hosea Hosea the prophet writing hundreds of years before Christ came and he says, I will call those who were not my people. In other words, I will call those who were not Jews by nature. I will call those who were not my people, my people. And her who was not beloved, beloved. And that word beloved literally means divinely loved ones. Those are those whom God has set his love upon. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though they, the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that shall be saved. For the Lord will execute his word upon the earth thoroughly and quickly. And not just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth, that is the Lord of hosts, had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom, and would have resembled Gomorrah. Well, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why is this? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling, the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. It is clear that Gentile believers, us, those who are not Jews, we are not an afterthought in the mind of God. He didn't say, oh, maybe I ought to do something about them. This was a plan from eternity past, unfolding now. We are not an afterthought in the mind of God, but are believers according to his eternal purpose, according to his eternal decree. But Paul isn't done in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2 with his description of the calling with which he received from God. For we read in verse 2, Ephesians 3 and verse 2, If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, and this harkens back to the history that I began with. Paul had been delivered from darkness to light, transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son, and given a stewardship, a commission by God himself to proclaim his gospel to the Gentiles. And this was a stewardship that drove Paul many times to the point of death, but nothing would stop him from accomplishing his mission because he was driven on by the love of God that, that God had demonstrated to him in rescuing him from the kingdom of the devil. And he said that the love of Christ constrains me. The love of Christ overwhelmed him. He was incapacitated by such a great love that God has laid out upon him. He said, it, it constrains me, drives me, moves me, compels me to go on. And I'm reminded of something that Paul Washer said in, in his testimony, which is applicable here. He described himself as a popular guy. Now think about Paul. Paul was a Pharisee. He was 
So he was taught by Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers in Judaism. He was, he was taught by a famous man. He said in, in Philippians chapter 3, he, that he was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was, according to their law, he was blameless. He, was, he had reached higher and farther than his contemporaries. So he was the cool guy. He was the guy that they looked up to. Paul Washer said in his testimony, he described himself as a popular guy on the college campus he attended. He was the guy with the cool car and all the trappings of popularity. But one day, Christ invaded his life and everything changed. And suddenly, the same cool guy was now standing in the center of the college handing out gospel tracts and calling people to repentance and faith in Christ. And the people who had thought that he was cool now thought that he was a fool. They crumpled up his tracks and laughed in his face. His close friends grabbed him and took him into a room and said, What are you doing? You're making a fool of yourself. And Paul said, Washer, he responded, he said, What else can I do? He died for me. Paul, the apostle, is the same thing. Christ died for me. I can do nothing else. The love of Christ He constrains me, it presses me on, it pushes me on to more and more and further and greater deeds for his glory. Because I love him, because he loved me first. The love of Christ constrained him and still constrains Paul Washer to this day. It was the same love that constrained the Apostle Paul to do what he did. He was a driven man who loved sinners and desired to see them come to the same faith in Christ that he knew, the same love of Christ that he had come to know. The gospel message was like fire in his bones, and it needed to come out. All of of this he says in verse 3, he says that by revelation that there was made known to me the mystery of, as I had written before, in brief. And where did Paul learn this mystery? Where did he learn the gospel? Where where was he taught the truth that he preached with such fervency? Turn with me to Paul's epistle to the Galatians in chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, and we'll begin at verse 11. Galatians 1, beginning at verse 11. Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 11. In Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 11, Paul says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which, I, which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither learned it or received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul was granted to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, and to learn the gospel message from him. And what was that message which Paul had received through the revelation of Christ? Listen to the words of Paul found back in our text, beginning at verse 4. This is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, where he says this, By referring to this, When you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it now has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, to be specific. And here it is again. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Behold the love of God for sinners. There is no one worthy of salvation. No one has achieved enough goodness to attract God's attention. And listen to this indictment of the human race by the, the prophet Isaiah. He says, for all of us, All, that's a comprehensive all. But no one left out. All of us have become like one who is unclean. The picture is someone who is leprous, who could not be with other people in society. 
He was diseased, and his disease was highly contagious. And Paul is saying, we were all unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments, filthy rags. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Do you understand this statement by the prophet Isaiah? If left to ourselves, we are all damned to an eternity in the fires of hell. And this is what we deserve. But God in grace did not leave us to ourselves. For while we were still helpless, according to the scriptures, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Behold the unfathomable riches of Christ and that he loved us so much that he willingly died in the place of all who will call upon his name. For hardly the scriptures say, well, well, one, well, for one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet st- sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. And behold further still the love of God, in that he did not leave himself without a witness, but he sent men like the Apostle Paul to declare his message of love and grace and mercy toward the children of men. And behold this man of God, The Apostle Paul, who burned with the light of eternity. He burned with the light of the glory of God and thundered out the message of the gospel with the power of God, for the glory of God, and for the salvation of sinners. He could not and would not be silenced until the Roman Emperor Nero had his head cut off. And even that did not silence Paul completely. For he who is dead yet speaks to the pages of the word of God. You see, if left to ourselves, no one would be saved. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, he sent his one and only son into this world to die in order to redeem sinners from their slavery to the devil. What man could not do, God did. Speaking to the members of the church at Ephesus, Paul said that even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive because it's by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. This is the message which Paul preached. He says in verse 8 of our text, Ephesians 3, 8, he says, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ And to bring to light what is the administration of the ministry, of this mystery rather, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. This is the message of immeasurable, unfathomable grace and love. And finally, after listing all of those magnificent blessings that have been poured out by God through Christ upon those who whom he chose for salvation, Paul did what anyone who really understands the magnitude of what God has done, he falls to his knees and worships, saying in verse 14, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. Not only does Paul worship, but he offers up a solemn prayer before the Father, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And he prays to God what is the second prayer in this wonderful letter. And I want to spend the rest of our time unpacking the details 
of this petition offered before the throne of grace on behalf of all who have been delivered by God from slavery to the devil, because this is my prayer for you as well. Let me first read the prayer in its entirety, and then we'll break it down and look at just what a pastor wants for his flock. Beginning at verse 14 again, we'll read this in its entirety, from verse 14 to verse 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family of heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In this prayer, we have, if we break it down, we have the address to God in verses 14 and 15, the petition in verses 16 to 19, and the doxology in verses 20 to 21. And I, can, I hope you can see how this follows the model prayer taught to us by Christ himself. With that, let me begin. Again, this is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. And we'll stop there. I don't, wanna, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, the position of your body is not important in prayer. Well, I agree to a point. But the problem is not the position of the body, but the attitude of our minds that is the problem. You see, we have become so casual in our attitude towards God that it borders on arrogance. Do you understand who it is that you are addressing when you pray? It is Almighty God whose throne room we are entering. If men bow before earthly kings, why is it that we think nothing of not bowing before the eternal sovereign king of the universe. And have you read in Philippians chapter 2 that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul's bowing demonstrates an attitude of reverence and worship that is due the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it represents a grateful man who knows his Redeemer. Let's continue reading Paul's address to God in verses 14 and 15. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Here Paul acknowledges that God is the creator of all mankind. It is God who gives to all people life and breath and all things, who made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. To this almighty God, who is the creator and sustainer of all things, Paul offers his petition, saying in verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Who is the one who strengthens the helpless? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will, walk, they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Who strengthens Samson to perform his 
mighty deeds. It was the Spirit of God. And that's just dealing with the physical realm. But we're talking of more than the physical realm. Paul is asking that God would strengthen his people with spiritual strength to fight spiritual battles. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal or of the flesh, but are spiritually powerful for the pulling down of strongholds. And they have to be spiritual because we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this wickedness, of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The arm of the flesh is powerless against such a foe as this, but God strengthens us so that we can do all things. That's why the scripture says the people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Daniel did not rely upon men when he was cast into the den of lions, but trusted in God to deliver him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not try to fight their way out of getting thrown into the fiery furnace, but put their confidence in God alone. And what was the outcome of these battles? God shut the mouths of the lions so they did not harm Daniel. And he so shielded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego while they were in the, fir the furnace that when they came out, there was not even a smell of smoke on them. And cannot this same God protect you against those who have set themselves up against you as at your adversaries? Behold, the Lord's hand is not too short that he cannot save, nor his ear so dull that he cannot hear. David offers this counsel to those who are in the heat of spiritual battle when he says, Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious towards wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, the psalmist says, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret in only this evil doing. For evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, but he will not be there. Do you trust the Lord with all of your heart? Or do you lean on your own understanding of things? Solomon tells us that in all of our ways, it is in everything that comes our way, we are to acknowledge or know that God is the Lord, that he is in control of all events, and those who trust in God have the promise that he will direct our paths. Which leads to Paul's next petition, so that Christ may dwell in your heart's through faith. The idea here is of Christ being at home within you. He said that he will settle on and make his abode with us in John chapter 15. Which means he speaks of the fact that he will intimately and continually possess and fill not only your heads with his doctrine, but your affections with his spirit. And consider what is said as what we read in Psalm 91, as you did the responsive reading. Are you controlled by the Spirit of God? Are you ruled by Christ and His Word? Then the Scriptures say to you, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark that is a wall of protection. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, 
or of the arrow that flies by day, or of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on it with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made of the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he, who give, he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name, says the Lord. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will re rescue him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and let him know or let him see my salvation. Is that not wonderful? Is that not glorious, comforting truth? Paul continues with his next petition to God for the Ephesian church, saying that you be rooted and grounded in love, literally unmovably resting in the truth of the word of God, that you may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. How lofty are the things of God. They are inconceivable. Just as it is written, things which eye has seen, ear has not, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man all the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And if you are in Christ Jesus today, if he is your Lord and Savior, these things have been granted to you. And I close with Paul's benediction in verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, what can we say? These truths are overwhelming. You have spoken these words for our hearing, so that we might hear them, so that we might know them, so that we might be comforted by them. They are glorious, because you, God, are glorious. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would cause the truth that you have allowed to be uttered from this pulpit, that you would cause these truths to be driven deep into our hearts, into our minds, that they might transform us from fearful to faithful. May you receive all the glory and the praise for what you do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.